This channel is part of the History Hits Network. August 1997. William and Harry were enjoying their summer holiday with Prince Charles at Balmoral, the Queen's Scottish retreat. Royal homes and estates are part of the heritage they share with Charles and the royal family. Even before their parents' divorce, they had grown accustomed to separate times with their father and mother. Now they were looking forward to seeing her again, but within days, their lives would be altered forever by her tragic death. William and Harry were left with treasured memories of a wonderful mother. Diana had enriched their childhood with experiences and adventures beyond those of any previous royal generation. The world mourned her passing with an unprecedented outpouring of grief. Millions of comforting tributes helped give William and Harry the courage to face the ordeal of her funeral. Diana's brave young princes walked with pride and dignity behind her coffin on its solemn passage to Westminster Abbey. It was their own decision. I think it was very interesting on the day of her funeral when they walked so solemnly behind her coffin with their father and their grandfather and their uncle to see how the younger boy, Harry, in a way, carried himself with a great deal more presence and, and conviction than the older boy, William, whose head was bowed almost virtually throughout, and clearly they both felt it equally. But Harry, the younger one, seems in some ways a tougher character. Also, interestingly, she was very consciously training up Harry, the younger one, as a sort of support system for his brother, because she knew from what she'd seen and herself lived through that life was actually going to be tougher for William. He was going to be the one in the focus the whole time. It would be quite tough for Harry, but he wasn't centre stage. And touchingly, they're very close, those two boys. And I think one thing their mother had achieved, although her work was interrupted, was to make them a mutual bonding, that be able to help each other out in situations like that in the future. Her children's flowers reminded the watching world of their dreadful loss. There would be no more white water rides, trips to theme parks or holidays in exotic locations. Diana had refused to bring up her sons hidden away in palace nurseries and schoolrooms. She had opened up for them a world unseen by earlier royal children. On visits like this to Niagara Falls, they saw, learned and explored as Diana prepared them for the duties their royal birth would demand in adult life. The mother, who filled their lives with fun, also took them on more private journeys, visiting the sick and the disadvantaged, who formed the focus of her charity work and campaigns. She gave William and Harry challenging experiences to offset the wealthy, privileged world of the royal family with its trappings of grandeur. Diana was the most tactile and demonstrative of royal mothers. She missed her sons badly when foreign tours kept them apart. Ignoring protocol, she would run ahead of Prince Charles, unable to contain her delight at being reunited with her boys after the inevitable absences created by royal duties. She once said, we have an obligation to care for our children, to encourage and guide, nourish and nurture and to listen with love to their needs in ways which clearly show our children that we value them. They, in turn, will then learn how to value themselves. Charles, too, believed in showing warmth and affection to the children, often publicly. His childhood had been blighted by too many parental absences and by a too rigid and formal nursery schedule. Charles and Diana's obvious love for their boys was not enough to keep the family together. However, the love they received from both parents in the past may prove a sound basis for emotional stability now their mother is gone.
there is no substitute for affection for those children and I, I think they've had a really good grounding of it despite the traumas that they've been through so young. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Some people say she almost smothered them when they were little, but because her marriage wasn't working, she put all her emotions and love into those two children. And anyone else that intruded on her space as a mother, um, she didn't like. Diana was aware of the royal traditions her sons would grow up with, but she also wanted them to be modern boys, streetwise in appearance. Seen on many happy family outings with their mother, their casual look was in keeping with a more ordinary childhood. When royal duty called, their appearance had to reflect the more formal side of their upbringing. Within their blood runs a thousand years or more of British royal history. They are the next generation of one of the world's most famous families who have been trained from the cradle to behave well in the public eye. In 1985, they joined their parents on Britannia for a cruise after Charles and Diana had made an official visit to Italy. William, then nearly three, had already learned how to perform as a junior royal Harry would follow in his footsteps, but without the pressure of being heir in line to the throne. Charles used to have a bath with William. There's one lovely story that Diana told about um, she couldn't find them anywhere. And eventually she went in the bathroom and there they were with all these enormous bubbles everywhere, sort of singing and playing. Um, and Charles is like a, a new man father. I mean, Betty Parsons, who was um, the midwife, who helped Diana with all her prenatal exercises, also used to, to talk to Prince Charles, and she gave him a book called The Expectant Father, which he devoured. So he was really, really interested and keen, and in fact, so much so, it used to irritate Diana. She used to say, anyone would think he was having the baby, not me. Prince William was born on June the 21st, 1982, less than a year after his parents' wedding. Diana was almost 21. His christening in the ornate setting of Buckingham Palace underlined his special position. Diana's natural reaction to calming her agitated son showed her gentle, caring attitude to motherhood. This was not the way of the Windsors, who had usually passed crying babies to their nannies. William's christening was held on the Queen Mother's 82nd birthday to show the link between the four royal generations. William was the first royal baby to accompany his parents on a major tour. In April 1983, he went to Australia, where he stayed on a special base with his nanny, Barbara Barnes, while Charles and Diana undertook an intensive programme of duties. Well, according to Diana, it was because the Australian Prime Minister invited her to take to bring her child along, which uh, and, and she thought that was a wonderful idea, and. and so did Prince Charles, uh, and, and so did the Queen, so they took him along. I mean, he wasn't with them all the time. And she also said it, it was a great help, because it gave her something to talk about um, when she met all, all, all the crowds, and she could talk about William and what he was doing, and you know, he was just beginning to crawl. So it was, it was a great bonus. At first, William didn't mind the photo calls that marked the milestones of his infancy. After his first crawl about, he was ready for bolder steps. Impition appealing, he had a natural flair in front of a camera. He seemed to enjoy the attention he received from massed ranks of photographers, recording the footballing skills of a future king. Diana and Charles agreed to these pose sessions, hoping to preserve some privacy at other times. They knew that the public wanted regular updates on William's progress. His first teeth, his early steps and words, his amusing habits of hiding behind doors and of flushing shoes down the lavatory were all dutifully recorded by a watchful press for an eager public. Charles understood the importance of creating a good image for the Waleses, first as a couple, then as a family. 
Suffering from bulimia, Diana later referred to these early years as the Dark Ages, although publicly there was little evidence of her inner misery. In the early years of their marriage, I constantly saw the prince patting Diana, encouraging her, whispering in her ear, telling her she was doing a great job, you know, patting her on the bottom and looking at her. They'd look at each other the way lovers do and laugh and smile at each other, you know, always gazing into each other's eyes. There's no doubt about it. They were a great couple in the beginning. The summer of 1984 marked a period of relative contentment as they awaited the birth of their second child. Diana knew from her doctors that the baby would be a boy, but she kept Charles in the dark. When Harry was born on September the 15th, Charles was said to be disappointed that his second son wasn't a girl. Behind the glowing pride of a radiant young mother was a troubled princess facing the disintegration of her marriage, just as her family life should have been blessed and happy. Despite their growing friction, Diana tried to share some of her husband's pastimes, making them family occasions for their sons to enjoy. Her affection for her children was always evident. She once said, hugging has no harmful side effects. If we all play our part in making our children feel valued, the result will be tremendous. William and Harry were introduced early to polo. At these matches, Sarah Ferguson, daughter of his polo manager, was often present. Soon she would become the Duchess of York, mother of their younger cousins, and a loving aunt to the royal princes. William and Harry can look back on many happy times they spent with her and Diana. She may offer a special comfort to them in sharing memories of those lost days. Summers also meant holidays with the Spanish royal family at their Mallorcan retreat. The Wales family went there from 1986 to 1988, when Charles and Diana were putting on a show of togetherness to disguise their separate lives and their separate loves. Going to Mallorca and missing part of the Balmoral break had been Charles's idea. Although King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia and their family were warm and hospitable, Diana felt ill at ease. Parental tensions were running high, but the young princes were already adjusting to their situation and their exalted position, where they were constantly photographed and commented on. William and Harry were growing into well-behaved youngsters who knew that princes were expected to be perfect in public. All the royal children have the most perfect manners, they, partly because they have the best choice of nannies to start with. And and William, when he was a little boy, I remember Barbara Barnes saying, you know, he used to open doors uh, for women and, and, you know, say sir to gentlemen. That's when he was eight years old, for goodness sake. You know, they have beautiful manners and they are very considerate to other people, um, which is something you perhaps don't get so much in ordinary children. Of course, there were rare lapses and the culprit would be quickly and firmly pulled back in line. Diana's boys adapted quickly to school life, starting at a kindergarten where they mixed well with other children. Like their father, both boys showed a talent for the stage. They were allowed to play on Granny's fire engine at Sandringham, in their best clothes. The boys were at ease with their father, even when he was nursing a painful broken arm. There were many endearing moments when Charles welcomed their company and their inquisitiveness. Harry's parents felt that second-born should never mean second-best, and Diana called him a complete joy. While William was more tuned into Diana's wavelength, Harry was always very close to Charles. In a conversation I had with the princess not long before she died in Kensington Palace, she did bring up the question of her concerns for Harry and that William would always be the one, the centre stage one who was going to be king. She was worried. Uh, for instance, rather touchingly, I thought that William would get all the girls. All the girls would go for Wills and poor Harry, would, who's only a couple of years younger, would be left out. And so she was already kind of taking steps to try and make sure that they were treated equally, even though in royal standing terms, William was, would always be number one. As Charles and Diana grew apart, her sons became her gentleman escorts for some evening engagements. Diana loved to show off her handsome boys, and they were thrilled to be seen with their glamorous and stylish mother. By now, their royal training enabled them to cope with more adult occasions. Diana, 
Every year, the boys were on display with their royal relatives on the palace balcony to celebrate the Queen's official birthday. The Yorks' first child, Beatrice, enjoyed playing with her cousin Harry. Together with her younger sister Eugenie, they became substitute daughters for Diana. She never had the little girl she wanted, but she resisted the temptation to mollycoddle her sons. Diana encouraged their boyish preferences for sports, such as skiing, go-karting, rafting and swimming. While hunting and shooting remained their father's territory, water sports were provided by a series of sunshine holidays with their mother. Differences between the two boys' personalities began to develop. William was the quieter, more intuitive. Harry, the more mischievous. Life is going to be much tougher for him than it is for Harry because he's going to be the future king after his father. He's going to be the center of attention. And I know Diana worried about that. And she was training up Harry as a kind of support system for his brother. They are very close. Um, life won't be too easy for Harry either, especially because I think in that period, the monarchy's going to be, quotes, modernized, uh, which means very slimmed down. Prince Charles wants it to be just the monarch and his heir. So Harry, unlike uh, some of the current royals, probably make, could go out and get it proper job if he wanted to and I think the British people would approve of that and lead a relatively normal life. For William, whatever happens to the monarchy, life is always going to be like it is for his mother. Hounded, harassed, pursued privately as well as publicly. Uh, his misfortune as well as his good fortune being that he looks rather like her and he's her legacy made flesh. Their school days were some of the happiest of any royal children. From kindergarten, they moved to Weatherby's Day School before boarding at Luggrove. Diana was always present for school sports days. They were timetabled in her diary before any other duties. Whatever the demands on her, or however difficult her private life, she was always ready to cheer on her boys. She was no slouch when it came to the fiercely contested mother's races, her exercise and fitness routine usually ensuring a royal winner. Win or lose, whatever the outcome of the children's races, Diana would always reward them with a cuddle. As a result of her loving approach and her interest in all their activities, her sons felt cherished. More than anything, she believed in the giving and receiving of affection. I don't think you can spoil children with too much love and attention. I think that's, that's a myth. But um, I found that she didn't spoil them in terms of being a sensible mother. She was very good at nagging them about their manners. And as a result, they're both beautifully mannered boys. And, you know, being tidy, because Diana was fanatically tidy. And so she was always reminding them to pick up things. It's, that's the sort of things that mothers do. I mean, that's normal. To have somebody come along and nag you, I think, is is keeping you in touch with reality. You know, life is not easy and you have to learn to, to look after yourself. And I think she gave a lot of that. She was very well balanced mother in that sense. To achieve her objective of well-adjusted children, Diana allowed them to follow some distinctly non-royal pursuits. Racing buggies in America was considered dangerous and not in keeping with the House of Windsor's constrained attitude to child rearing. Diana was sometimes criticized for lavishing too many treats on her children, too many trips to theme parks or too many expensive holidays. She may have overcompensated for the missing stable domestic background that she had sought to provide and had failed. Diana was also accused of upstaging her husband by her displays of affection and by her action-packed adventures, which made him look a stuffy, uncaring father. These sort of activities were good training for the family firm, as older members privately call the royal family. With the Queen Mother, their great-grandmother, William and Harry behave according to royal tradition. She is a consummate performer, never revealing a trace of her true feelings in public. Diana was wary of the Queen Mother and thought that she exercised too much influence over Charles. However, there were times Diana could not avoid her and had to make polite conversation. The Queen had insisted on taking Harry in hand. His early liveliness was curbed and he was quietly groomed for his eventual role. 
He soon formed a close relationship with the Queen and also with Prince Philip, gentler and kinder with his grandchildren than with his own children. At Christmas and Easter, the Queen wanted her immediate family around her to celebrate those special days. The Queen's always played a very important role with William, and Diana told me that William gets on very well with his grandmother, and she was delighted about that. And for the past few years, the Queen has been um, having tea with William on a Sunday, you know, because he just has to go across the bridge from Eton. So he'll go round to Windsor Castle with his detective, and when he walks in the room, her face lights up, and they sit down and they chat about this and that. And she tells him what she's been doing and who she's met. And he tells her, now this is a tradition that the monarch passes down you know, through the generations, her wisdom. And there was a time when, when the Queen hardly saw William, so she's delighted to have formed this bond with him. And surprisingly enough, Prince Philip is very close to William too. So he has the great support of his grandparents. Those family gatherings helped build what Diana called platforms of mutual affection, which will help William and Harry through the inevitable feelings of bereavement and what might have been. The royal family will have to cope with anguish and despair, which may return when triggered by places and events. The boys may turn to their older cousins, Princess Anne's children, Peter and Zara Phillips, who love their Aunt Diana and also have happy memories of her good humour and her kind heart. But Peter and Zara are different. Much further down the line of succession, they will be allowed to have freedom in their choice of careers, while William and Harry have a narrower path ahead. Their mother, who was such a dynamic force in their lives, had tried to raise her sons in an imaginative way for a new millennium and a new style of monarchy. She wanted them to feel a sense of unity with ordinary people. Now her work will have to be completed by the family she sought to change. Well, I think she felt that the Windsor family are very isolated, very cut off from real people and real life. And uh, she's right, they are. Um, you know, how often do you see Prince Charles in a supermarket? Does he know the price of a pint of milk? Uh, I'm sure he doesn't and probably doesn't even know how to put petrol in his own car. So she was determined that her boys would not grow up like that. She wanted to keep their feet on the ground. So she used to take them to supermarkets, go shopping, take them to the movies, queue up at McDonald's and at fun fair, um, you know, leisure parks, all in a, a desperate attempt to give them some experience of the real world. Diana's father, the 8th Earl Spencer, died in 1992, robbing William and Harry of an affectionate and down-to-earth grandfather. Diana said, My father always taught me to treat everyone as an equal. I have always done, and I am sure that William and Harry are the same. Christmases with their mother came to an end a few years ago, when Diana could no longer stand the strain of being with her estranged husband's family. After the divorce in 1996, there was little contact. With her unique elegance, she had been the star attraction on so many royal occasions. Then she became a semi-detached royal, an awkward situation for everyone, and one that would cause anxiety for her children. Yet it was Diana who instilled much of the basic royal training into her sons. The royal family benefited from her huge popularity, which was also being passed on to William and Harry. She taught them how to behave on walkabouts, how to shake hands, receive flowers, and how to conduct themselves under the spotlight. They simply had to follow her example. Impressing the Commonwealth, such as on this visit to Canada, was all part of the job. There is little doubt that Diana was used to enhance the prestige of modern royalty abroad. She had been the jewel in the crown, a shining, charismatic woman who had made the House of Windsor look stale. She desperately wanted to keep the best of its traditions while bringing it into line with a world ready to enter the 21st century.
Diana was grooming her two boys through contact with the crowds who turned out in their thousands to see them. There may have been an element of rivalry with Charles, who never shared the easy rapport his wife did with the public. You have to remember, because of their tender years, that actually half their lives had been blighted by the public warfare of their parents' very acrimonious divorce. It's tough enough for any kids if their parents split up at that age, but in the case of William and Harry, there was all sorts of public warfare, the dirty linen being hung out a bit too much, friends of Prince Charles, friends of Diana, mutual insults flying in the national press. Uh, the, paper, the schools can say that they hid the newspapers from these boys, but we all know that other school children can be pretty cruel, and uh, it's not always possible to do that. I think both parents, in their different ways, tried to nurse them through each stage, and we know that Diana kept going down to these schools to tell them what was going to happen next before they read it in the papers. But I think it's bound to have left scars on both of them. And uh, it would be surprising if William and Harry, in their different ways, didn't grow up without certain emotional problems that any children who'd been through that at that age would have. In public, Charles and Diana were obliged to put aside their differences and appear united. However, unity was short-lived, and even when visiting their son's school, Ludgrove, they would travel in different cars. Charles's admission of his affair with Camilla Parker Bowles placed the issue in the public domain. Their relationship may still affect the future of the monarchy. What I'm told by people close to the prince is that they've never met Camilla. He's always kept those, those two areas of his life totally separate, partly because he knows the children are aware of Camilla's role in his life and that they, he didn't wish to give them that additional problem of sorting out how they felt about her, this woman that had intruded into their family. So to prevent them being tortured about it or feeling divided loyalties, you know, torn between their mother and their father, he kept Camilla away from them. And I think that was a very considerate way to behave. After the Wales's separation in 1992, William and Harry found their out-of-school time divided between both parents. Unlike the Yorks, who remained friends after their marriage breakup, the Waleses rarely met as a family. A pattern developed of one expensive holiday with Diana, followed by one with Charles. Ski trips at upmarket resorts such as Leck in Austria with Diana and Closters in Switzerland with Charles in the winter would be followed by exclusive Caribbean retreats or cruising on luxurious yachts in the summer. Charles and Diana vied with each other to give their sons the best times, the most fun. It is a picture well known to many children of split families, and it was one that led to suggestions that William and Harry were being spoiled materially. Well, I think it might appear to us that they're spoiled because they seem to have everything. Very difficult not to. I think any child uh, 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 a divorced parents is spoiled. You can't help it because the father gives them one thing and the mother gives them another. And it sort of almost subconsciously can become a competition. If they competed for the love of their children, it was like all divorced parents. When holidays come around, uh, they both try to give them great treats. Well, uh, for instance, you know, that is the fantastic advantage of having a, fa a broken home. You get two lots of presents at Christmas, you get two lots of holidays. Uh, so it's not all bad, you know. Uh, uh, for instance, the last year Diana was alive, the boys went on safari with their father, and uh, shortly afterwards, or around the same time, they went to Barbuda in the Caribbean with their mother. Well, that doesn't sound bad to me. A private holiday, particularly in a ski resort, soon became a press circus with three unwilling performers. To keep the peace, the royal party obliged with some controlled performances. Diana resented the constant intrusion of the paparazzi, keen to make a quick profit from snatched pictures of the princess and her sons. Ominously, Diana found herself in dramas and squabbles with pressmen, which tended to encourage rather than put them off. Situations could get out of hand. 
The boys, in particular William, dreaded these unseemly scuffles and confrontations. I remember once a, a terrible fight in the street in Austria when William and Harry were caught right in the middle of it. Two Italian paparazzi tried to, um, I mean, really get literally right up their noses. It was ridiculous. They're trying to take pictures from this sort of distance. And Diana objected and got very upset. And uh, her policeman rugby tackled one of the photographers to the ground. Well, the two boys were standing there watching all this and they became very concerned. And Diana had to hurry them away back to their hotel. And that was the sort of incident that I don't think they should have witnessed. They shouldn't have seen that. I mean, you can't plan when paparazzi are going to pop out of the woodwork and photograph you. But I think if Diana had taken it very calmly and kept walking or, you know, stopped and let them get a picture, it would have been a lot easier on the children than having this big confrontation in the street. <laughs> Me. Could I ask you to respect my children's space? Yes, sir. Because I brought the children out here for a holiday. We've had 15 cameras following us today. As a parent, I want to protect the children. The effect on the boys was different. Harry was less troubled, but he refused to cooperate with the cameras if he sensed William was disturbed. The blood bond between the brothers was already strong, providing each other with an ally at times of stress. At boarding school for much of the year, they wanted to enjoy their time out with each parent without excessive intrusion. William began hiding his face in his hands. He was no longer the little boy who readily played at photo calls, but an anxious teenager needing space and privacy. He found little of either. He doesn't like the spotlight, hates publicity, hates facing cameramen. And I think that's largely because he saw his mother involved in so many scuffles in the street with uh, photographers, especially foreign ones, continental ones. William's problems with cameramen are so bad now that they've become a serious worry to the Queen. Um, I mean, I remember talking to Diana about this once and saying, uh, you know, she said, oh, William doesn't like being photographed. And I said, well, I'm sorry, it goes with the job. If you're going to be a king, you've got to be photographed. She said, oh, you're very hard. And I said, well, I think I'm just being realistic. You know, the sooner William gets accustomed to photographers, the better it's going to be easier for William. This was advice the Queen Mother would have approved of, always at ease in public. On her 95th birthday, she kept William close by her, perhaps signalling her hopes for the monarchy through the teenage prince. She may have hoped that her confidence would rub off on the sensitive young boy. Prince Charles decided to drive William back to school. He thought, well, it's not often you get Charles and William together. This is going to be a fantastic picture. And when William had to come out of the clubhouse and kiss his grandmother goodbye and walk out, he walked out backwards so he couldn't see his face. I mean, I, I don't know how he did it, but he guided himself backwards, walking backwards towards the cameras. And then he leapt into the car and hid down in the well of the passenger seat, crouched right down with his, all we could see was his back. I said, oh, William, this is ridiculous. You know, what stupid behavior for a future king. Anyway, a Prince Charles was waving and smiling, and he could have done with some help from his son. If his son had waved and smiled beside him, that would have helped Prince Charles's, you know, poor image quite a bit, but no. So Prince Charles drove off with this ridiculous situation of his son hiding, and Prince Charles waving to everybody, and that's how he took him back to school. Diana included friends of her boys on their holidays and outings. Sometimes she took the children of her staff, another change in royal policy and one designed to keep William and Harry in touch with the real world. Her own need for freedom and to break away from protocol was evident. She had found palace restrictions suffocating and archaic. Diana was a very modern mother, one whose boundless energy and mischievous sense of humor will be dreadfully missed by her sons.
Their young cousins may be an important part in bringing the much-needed element of fun back into William and Harry's lives. Beatrice and Eugenie were close to William and Harry and shared several holidays with them. On this unique occasion, William felt relaxed enough to answer questions with his brother and cousins, giving them moral support, responding to inquiries about their standards of skiing. Well, improving is very good. They're improving. Very good skiers. Richard, I'm sorry, could you ask around here? Sorry. Question behind us. Rob, we're not sorry. looking at your... William, do you hope to have a ski together at some point? Um, yes, it would be good fun. Yeah, very good. Enjoy it. Often criticised for his frequent absences as the boys were growing up, Charles did enjoy many happy times with them. He often forgot his princely dignity to clown around and share the rough and tumble that was denied him in his childhood. Diana once revealed that he loved the nursery routine and came home to bottle feed them as babies. Charles has instilled much of his love of the countryside in his boys. They have helped him with tasks on his farm and gardens. This paternal bond will form the basis to develop Charles's relationship with his sons, now that he has to be both father and mother. There will still be times when the boys need the guiding feminine touch of an elder sister figure rather than a mother substitute. Charles's friend Tiggy Leg Burke, who comforted them in the terrible days after Diana's death, may provide a gentle female influence to guide them into adult life. William joined Eton College in 1995. It's now a kinder, more supportive school than in days gone by. Charles and Diana were in complete harmony over their son's schools. Charles chose Eton because he had hated his own school, Gordonston, so much. Eton College was also a place where generations of Diana's family had been educated. It also allows William easy access to nearby Windsor Castle, where the Queen often spends her weekends. William is exactly like his father, very reserved, very thoughtful, conscientious. Um, you know, he even sounds like his father now that his voice is broken. You'd swear you're listening to Charles. So, you know, he looks like his mother, but he's his father's son. Harry doesn't suffer so much. Harry's rather thick-skinned. He's very like his mother. He quite revels in the spotlight and uh, makes jokes about it. He's got exactly his mother's personality. He, he's very exuberant, very lively, fun-loving. Nothing phases Harry. Diana often took the leading role with her elder son. She was guiding him towards his destiny as king. She wanted the monarchy to survive, modernized and in touch with its people for William to take the throne in adult life. She believed she would never be queen and doubted that Charles would become king. She poured her hopes and ambitions into William. He was you know, barely 10 years old when uh, she started revealing how she felt in front of him. and. Uh, I think, as a result, William's matured very fast. He's much more mature than most boys of 15. But that's also perhaps because of the daunting uh, burden that lies ahead of him, the, the monarchy. And uh, when you're 15, you might want to be a rock star or a nuclear physicist. You don't want your life mapped out for you. Kids of that age want to feel free. They're, all their school friends are talking about, you know, I'm going to backpack around Africa or something. And, and he doesn't have that choice. It's, it's very sad. I've heard Prince Charles talk about how awful it is to have your whole life mapped out for you. And I know William's a very sensitive boy, and he'll have absorbed a lot of that and think, well, I've got the same fate awaits me, sitting around waiting for my parent to die so I can become king. Who wants that? You know, it's, it doesn't seem like a real job. Eton's elitist image belies the fact that it is now a modern school. William's schoolmates are drawn from a wide section of society. They will choose their careers. His was prescribed by his birth. I think one of the effects of him becoming much closer to his father and perhaps spending much more time with his royal grandparents is that William will be instilled with the same sense of duty that Charles was in his youth and will begin to take the duties very seriously which is important because you occasionally wonder in a modern age in which we live with a prime minister who's pledged to modernize and change Britain, shed the past, shed ceremonial a bit, do unthinkable things. 
whether William, given that all he's been through, might say in the next few years, who needs this? Uh, the people don't seem to want us anymore. We're going into Europe. What's the monarchy's role? It would be very human and people would understand if he said, I don't think I want to do this. In January 1997, Harry went skiing with Charles while William preferred to stay out of sight with his grandparents in the peaceful sanctuary of Sandringham. Second-born sons have become monarchs, notably George V and George VI this century. Although history often repeats itself, Charles and Diana wanted Harry raised as a support to his brother. Diana felt that William will come to the throne earlier than many expect. William is being groomed for his burden, while Harry can have more freedom ahead of him. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you Harry. Thank you. Well, I hope that Harry is left alone by the press to uh, explore life a bit uh, during his youth and early years, and perhaps not to perform the traditional royal role of launching ships and unveiling plaques and living off the state and being a bit miserable, uh, living in the goldfish bowl with strains on whatever marriage he makes. Maybe he could just go out and get a proper job. William's confirmation in March 1997 was the last occasion the Waleses were together publicly as a family. His proud mother had already taken him to the threshold of adulthood. Through her, he had grown wise beyond his years. I've heard it said that uh, when she went down to see him at Eton and he heard the scrunch of the tires on the gravel, he thought, oh God, she, because she always brought problems with her. She would want to share with him the fact that she was doing that panorama interview, for instance, or something that she knew was coming up in the newspapers. And it was generally bad news. And I think that was quite tough on William. Harry was really too young, perhaps, to be included in some of that. By the end of her life, the unexpected end of her life, William did seem to have become a kind of senior advisor to his mother. Various big decisions, she told us, uh, were down to him. The decision to surrender her title of Royal Highness without too much fuss. And of course, we all thought he'd give it back to her when he became king. Uh, the, apparently, the decision to sell those frocks at auction at Sotheby's in New York this summer was uh, his idea. She credited him with that in the foreword to the uh, manual, the brochure for those frocks. Uh, things like that. And he, he was still very young, really, to be doing things like that. Maybe it made him mature beyond his years. Maybe it just burdened him with a bit more to worry about than most mid-teenagers already have. Diana took her sons to the Royal Tournament in London, part of the traditions and pageantry of the House of Windsor. Their friends went too. Diana encouraged friendship. She felt it was vital to have trusted companions. She would have wanted her beloved boys to find the lasting happiness that had eluded her. But who could compete with such a beautiful, loving mother? And I know he likes blondes. He, he's, he's always heading in for blondes, just like his father. So, you know, it's going to be tough, isn't it? To, I mean, most boys like to get a, a girl just like their mother was. But um, for William, is there another girl out there who's, you know, maybe 12 or 13, 14 today, who's going to grow into somebody who's not only as beautiful as Diana, but as compassionate, as warm, have that magic with ordinary people? So, you know, it could be a long search for poor old William. Let's just hope for both their sakes that those boys are given the freedom to make marriages that really work, find girls that they really care about, who really care about them, who are prepared to put up with all the inconveniences of being royal, as well as the considerable perks and home comforts of being royal, but above all that these marriages don't end in divorce, like their parents, like so many royal marriages recently, because of the strains, and because of the people in the House of Windsor being so cold to the people that marry into it. I think Diana's left enough with those boys for that not to be true of them. Perhaps there is less pressure on William now without his mother around, although it sounds cruel to say it. But I think he's losing more than he's gained. I mean, he's losing that affection that she gave him, the constant support she gave him. She also treated him like a grown-up, which is what every teenager longs for. She'd ask his advice, say, well, William, what do you think about this? Should I do this or shouldn't I? Now, that is very flattering. And she didn't tell him what to do. I mean, Prince Charles is exactly the same. I've heard this for several years now, that whenever they decide that they're going to go somewhere or do something or there's going to be a photo call, they say, well, we were thinking of doing this. What do you think, William? And they also ask Harry. And they ask for their input. 
childhood's end came with the news of their mother's death. For the rest of their lives, they will have a kaleidoscope of precious recollections, of how good it was to be with her on those thrills and spills adventures, to share the daredevil rides, to be hugged and cuddled, to feel her warmth, her laughter. The end of her life created the beginning of another. The Diana phenomenon was born. Diana's legacy lives on in the remarkable effect she had on the spirit of our age. To change the way millions view their world as she did is a gift granted to very few. Her brother said at her funeral, Diana was the very essence of compassion, of duty, of style, of beauty. We will feel cheated always that you were taken from us so young. Yet we must all learn to be grateful that you came along at all. Your joy for life transmitted wherever you took your smile, and the sparkle of those unforgettable eyes, your boundless energy, which you could hardly contain. Outside the gates of Balmoral, William and Harry, supported by the grieving royal family, saw the flowers and read the tributes to Diana. Those touching messages of condolence served as a rehearsal for the overwhelming sights that would greet them at Diana's funeral. Before that sad event, they would return to Kensington Palace, their mother's home, and witness the oceans of flowers left in loving memory of a princess who died too soon. The Queen would make her own tribute to Diana, saying, I admired and respected her for her energy and her commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. Those boys will lean heavily on the royal family, but as they grow up into men, there may be questions that are hard to answer. How did Diana come to be divorced and all but excluded from the royal fold, although she had fulfilled every possible royal and maternal duty to perfection? Millions watched the sad procession and emotional service, but no grief was more profound than her son's. The exceptional young men, their enigmatic uncle, Earl Spencer, praised in his fiery address. To others, she was an English rose, a people's princess, a queen of hearts, an icon, even a saint. To William and Harry, Diana was simply their mother, and they will never totally get over their loss. Over her coffin, Earl Spencer vowed that Diana's blood family would protect her sons from the excesses of protocol and press harassment. Charles will share his belief that William and Harry should not be totally immersed in duty and tradition, and that their souls should sing openly as Diana planned. He will continue her task of raising their sons to independence and maturity. It will not be easy.